continue talking about multilingual speakers in multilingual cities today, but I will focus on sociophonetic variation, and I will be doing that in reference to adolescents, and I will be looking specifically at Polish-English adolescents in the UK. So we're moving to London from Berlin. Um, and I will, to do that, I will be drawing on um, the, um, the project that we're about to finish, so this is a still, um, I'm presenting preliminary analysis of our data, but this is a larger project on family language policy, um, which has been a multi-level, multi-community and multi-family type investigation into the ways multilingual and transnational families go about linguistic resources in the UK. And we pay particular attention to three immigrant communities with very different histories of migration and very different linguistic and cultural resources. So we're actually looking at Chinese, Polish, and Somalis, and there are reasons why we selected these. And I will today focus on the Polish strand of the project. It's a, it is, the whole project is a um, cross-university initiative, and uh, these are some questions that we've been kind of investigating in the larger project. Um, but today I will, um, we've decided to focus on sociophonetic variation and um, on the ways multilingual youth um, develop their multilingual repertoires in Britain. So um, to do that, um, I think it's quite an order to um, mention how we see sociophonetic variation. So we see it as dynamic, systematic, multidimensional and meaningful. Um, and uh, also this type of variation allows speakers to place themselves in the social landscape because through its indexical properties. So we draw on sociolinguistic research, so we're saying in the sociolinguistic theory, and that allows speakers to signal their group membership. But the sociophonetic variation actually never um, operates in isolation, so we're looking at styles, and here um, we are talking about co-occurrence patterns in the speech of the youth that we study. So we're not really um, looking at cohesive, distinct language systems, but collections of features. And here we draw on scholars who um, have worked on English in London, and I will come back to the reason why this is uh, done in such a way in London. Um, in this take, the styles are ideological, which evokes the notion of language ideology. So these um, cultural systems of ideas about social and linguistic relationships together with a loading of moral and political interests, and these can be both explicitly articulated and embodied in communicative practice. Um, so, so far we know that there have been many studies on sociophonetic variation that kind of show the link between sociophonetic variation and uh, speakers' conceptualization of their social world. Many of these studies have been done in monolingual contexts, so uh, many here in the United States, um, some in Europe as well, and they actually link both segmental and supersegmental variation to speakers' ideas about their social world as well. In Europe, there has been a tradition of uh, looking at urban youth as the group that is quite interesting to study. Um, and often these projects have been done in northwestern Europe, uh, looking at multi-ethnic um, neighborhoods. Uh, and scholars often looked at um, different, um, the acquisition of variation and the dominant languages in these cities. Um, and in London, there have been projects on that as well. And in some neighborhoods in London, uh, scholars have been arguing that we um, can see the emergence of multi-ethnic London English, not in all neighborhoods, because that seems to be related to, uh, uh, to the um, uh, com ethnic composition of of, London, of the particular neighborhood. London is the, the most diverse, um, ethnically and racially diverse city in Europe, uh, and in the UK as well. So there are um, neighborhoods where you have um, a lot of um, multi-ethnic, uh, so the um, percentages of multi-ethnic um, um, sort of groups are higher, and um, there are also those where um, these are still more Anglo um, uh, speaking sort of, uh, groups, and you can see that this is reflected in the way they use, particularly the vowel system changes here, and um, um, also lexical items and other things. So, um, because often these projects look at uh, multi-ethnic uh, communities, we argue that it's actually quite relevant to also look at what these people do with the other linguistic resources. So what they do with the other languages that are, or linguistic resources that are at their disposal, and uh, the body of research on multilingual speakers has shown that um, the, the results can differ. So we can have 
um, speakers who uh, compartmentalize their linguistic resources pretty, in a pretty neat way, but we also have those who value the very mixing of languages. In the UK, most of the studies that have been done have been done on the long-term communities. So um, that means mostly British Asian communities. Um, and here, uh, for example, Roxy Harris argued that in his study of Black Hill Youth, which is a um, neighborhood in London uh, where a lot of British Asian youth live, um, there, the performances that he observed were dominated by Britishness and local uh, London features, but that combined with Asian languages that, these, um, uh, that this youth actually used allowed them to construct a new positioning in the world. Um, so, in terms of the Polish speaking community, uh, less has been done, uh, and I will come back to that in a second, but we do know that the Polish speaking youth and young adolescents actually are uh, employing uh, sociophonetic variation, can have been observed to be employing sociophonetic variation in meaningful ways. There have been studies on acquisition of uh, variation in English. In Edinburgh, London, these are school projects. I looked at um, um, actually the uh, the other Roy Ryan, so I looked at um, um, at the speaking styles in Polish. So what these speakers did with Polish, and it turned out that some speakers were actually drawing on English phonetic features in selected linguistic contexts when they were speaking, both segmental and supersegmental. So there is potential for ideological alignments and network link practices to actually influence how these speakers use their sociophonetic variation. Uh, the Polish-speaking uh, community in, uh, in Britain is quite important to look at, not, uh, not only because today it's one of the largest immigrant communities in Britain, but also because most of these um, migrants actually arrived in the UK after 2004. So that is when Britain opened its market to Eastern European migrants, and 90% of the people who can be classified as Polish arrived in the UK then. Um, that also sociolinguistically means that most of these migrants were able to use new technologies and cheap transportation. This is here a very short distance between Poland and the UK, so they do travel a lot. This is it. From London, you have 14 flights a day alone, and there are flights from other places as well, so it's a very a mobile community as well. Um, importantly for us, um, this community is often, um, despite the fact that this community is often described as um, homogeneous, it's quite heterogeneous in terms of socioeconomic background, there is intergenerational variation, and also they're uh, distributed absolutely everywhere in the UK. So these are just uh, areas with um, largest concentrations, but um, actually uh, Polish-speaking uh, people can be found both in metropolitan, rural, outer city, inner city localities, and the largest concentrations are in London and in South East, so this is where we did our project. And you see that in London, they only make one 0.2% of the whole population, and they actually spread around the city as well. So in our project, we wanted to understand how in the families people um, uh, go about their linguistic resources, and uh, as a result, how children and teenagers develop their multilingual re um, uh, repertoires. And we employed this sort of multi-method um, analysis. So we did a national survey on attitudes and, um, and, and practices of, of multilingual and monolingual speakers in the UK. And we, I also did ethnographic fieldwork, both um, at the community level and in families. And in families, we uh, worked with 10 families um, uh, where at least one person exhibited knowledge of Polish. Uh, and we looked at families with different socioeconomic backgrounds. So we had half half working class, middle class families. We had uh, two parent families, the majority, eight of them. We had two single parent families. We had also a mixed families um, among the eight. We had three mixed families as well. So we uh, wanted to also take into account um, at, at that level of the project those uh, different factors that can actually um, uh, have an influence in how languages are passed on or not. And uh, what we're seeing from this project is actually the rather complex combinations of local British and transnational Polish linguistic and also semiotic resources emerge and the linguistic performances that we observed are always embedded in the interplay of multiple factors. So they have to do with family makeup, obviously, but also participation structure. So if you have four kids who are um, of school age and they, they, they um, for example, are more likely to um, create more space for English to come in within the home as well. Um, so uh, we also see that uh, there are 
families and groups from the larger project can see that um, that tend to keep their resources separately, but there are also for the science speech community, we see that there are people who value the very mixing um, and those new um, understandings of themselves and collective understandings emerge as well. Importantly for sociophonetic variation, we see that parental strategies influence opportunities to learn socially meaningful pronunciation. And I will show you how this is played out in the case of one family that I work with. And this is a family which is a single parent family with one child. So there's an always one-to-one -one conversation. Um, I worked with this family for eight months and we have, at least, uh, we have 11 hours of audiovisual recordings that I made um, in, their, in their daily interaction because we were interested in how these um, ideas were en enacted in the everyday life. So we focus on the everyday life. Here the mother uh, um, moved uh, um, in 2000, so uh, just a bit before before the EU enlargement. She comes originally from rural Poland, so she was exposed to the rural varieties of uh, Polish as well. But then she uh, received higher education in Warsaw, so this is the capital city, so she was exposed to the standard variety and then completed further studies in the UK. The daughter was 13 years um, old at the time of the fieldwork. She was born in London um, and she also had a Polish-speaking father, but the father moved to Warsaw when she was uh, younger. So now she, because the European space allows freedom of movement, we know that she's, um, and also, so what she does is she spends up to two or three months in Poland every year, and um, uh, other than that, she's based in London, and she attends a, a British school with low levels of Polish-speaking peers. And this is important in London, you can have schools where you have up to 50% of Polish-speaking youth in them. Uh, reportedly, when she speaks to her peers, she um, uh, says that she usually speaks English to them. But uh, what she also did on the way is she completed um, six years of school, of Polish school, but not a Polish Saturday school, but she actually completed a school um, in Poland. This was an online school for anyone who's homeschooled in Poland. And she would travel back and forth every year to take exams in Poland as well. So she was actually completing both. And they live in a suburban district of London, which, uh, so the stats about this part of London are a bit worse than for other parts of London, but what we do know is that this is an area where English is mostly spoken, but Polish is also spoken, and as well as um, a number of languages. And in London, this is um, very important that you have um, people, the, the estimates differ, so it's between 200 and 300 languages spoken in London. Um, and there are different concentrations of those languages, of course. And, um, in the, uh, and because of that, uh, English is also acquired in the uh, environment where um, this is an additional language for many people. So uh, this is the, uh, the place where they live. Um, we did the uh, qualitative interview with them at the end of the whole project to understand how they conceptualize their uh, Polish and English resources, which were the main resources that they were using. And we see from, they both participated in that, and they both said that English was important, that they wanted to, uh, you know, they wanted to speak English in the UK, but importantly, the mother uh, kept saying that it was very important for them to keep Polish, that, um, and she exhibited very strong self-identification with the Polish culture. We caught the girl at the moment when she was reevaluating her positioning in the world, actually, and you see that here when she says, yes, in the past she was always from Poland, but now I'm a human being and I speak Polish and English, so she's actually at the moment where she's reconsidering that. Uh, what we also know is that actually the mother also describes herself as a conservative person, but they do have diverse networks. So networks are quite important here. She, um, they have both um, Polish and non-Polish networks as well. And that place doesn't really matter for them because they do move a lot within the European and not only space. Um, what um, is also important is their attitude towards language mixing, so the two actually differ. And the mother has a very strong atti uh, negative attitude towards language mixing, and she uh, always um, talks about that in relation to other Polish-speaking uh, people in the UK, and she doesn't necessarily like when people insert English when they speak Polish. 
And you can see that the girl doesn't really take that up in the conversation. So she says, oh, you're making it up. But the mother nevertheless continues, and she says, you either speak one language or the other. And that has an influence on what happens in this family. So as in all families that do maintain Polish, not everybody maintains this to the same, de uh, to the same degree here, uh, there is this reliance on everyday spoken Polish. You know, there are public spaces in the UK today where you can use a bit of Polish, but it is still not this institutionalized Polish as described uh, by Polish English. So they, they speak a lot in Polish, and the mother actually uses mostly what can be described within the standard, uh, the standard norms. Um, so uh, she relies heavily on colloquial expressions and lexica lexical items, but her pronunciation is mostly standard Polish. With English, she doesn't really code switch in those interactions that we have. What we see is that she's quite playful, as many of the people that we work with, with her um, accents that she's imitating on the way. What's uh, interesting in terms of the girl is um, that she, in a, uh, contrary to many accounts that um, talk about deficiencies of bilingual speakers, she's actually pretty proficient. So she's her um, Polish is pretty standard in terms of consonants. Constant uh, the Polish is heavy. Consonant cluster is heavy, and she actually doesn't really have problems with that. Her intonation doesn't really change, and this is interesting because I observed that to be happening in other, uh, for other speakers. Her vowels are mostly standard, but what is happening is that there is occasional vowel lengthening in the nuclear vi piece, and there seem to be um, the sort of uh, her a and o are neither Polish nor English actually when she pronounces that, and that's what I'm investigating now further. So I'm about to do the um, acoustic analysis of that. What happens also is that she uses occasional aspiration. So that also happens in selected uh, contexts when, uh, when she talks about her everyday life outside of the Polish world. Uh, when she code switches, when the task is um, uh, related to her English speaking world, she follows English phonotactic rules. Mm -hmm. However, in leisure activities, she's also um, you, uh, following the Polish norm for that. You know, there are many English loan words in Poland, in Polish uh, there, and models of indexicality associated with those. So for example, she would say something like kikes instead of kikes. So her um, E would be more fronted, and then you would have um, a plural mocking on the, um, the E is a normal, like that's how you do it in Polish as well. So um, you can see that she exhibits a high a sort of awareness of these um, models of indexicality. And it works for both languages from what we see. Most of our data is in Polish because of the um, nature of the data that we collected. The mother actually um, wants the Polish to be spoken in the house so there is little space for English to come in. But the girl, nevertheless, is quite aware of um, uh, you know, some variation within English. And she here you have a short video when she shows that she's aware of the differences between English and um, English, British English and Eastern European accents. So this is when she was, I don't know where that is. Okay. So when she was leaving out. No, again, describe the structure of a tropical storm. So you see, she doesn't speak like that on a regular basis. This is, uh, she's just mimicking the accent. She's uh, quite um, aware of the syllable structure differences. So she doesn't really use the vowels here. She pronounces the Polish vowels more. She also produces trills. She produces um, the stops rather than the th sound with the English one. So she's actually quite uh, um, aware of these differences and very playful. In the oh, in the other, I don't know where that is. Okay, no, here. Um, but what is also quite important is that she is able to use sociophonetic variation also in Polish, and this is not really um, a matter of. Uh, an, um, uh, uh, yeah, so that she does that to achieve particular interactional goals. And I'm going to show you a, a short video where she's putting makeup on the mother. It's just all anonymous. You will see that the fonts are not uh, great, but hopefully you will be able to follow it. They speak Polish, and the girl is accusing the mother of taking her highlighter. But what she does is she doesn't use the name of the mother, so she doesn't address her directly. Instead, she uses someone, which in standard Polish would be ktoś. However, she pronounces it as ktoś. <laughs> this is a very colloquial usage in Poland. So this is something that you can encounter in rural Poland, but also in colloquial everyday Polish. And this is used to achieve a particular interactional goal. This is to make the joke to the atmosphere, to actually create a sort of 
like, you know, I'm telling you off, but I'm not really. So uh, hopefully you will see how it works. With the, that is marked in the text, it's the English translation, but you will see that she... Or maybe not. The, it was working before. Okay, so you, what you see in this video is that actually she achieves the international goal, which is actually reflected by the mother's in the mother's turn, so not in the immediate one, so she, the mother doesn't laugh immediately, but then she laughs in the end, so she knows that this is like, the, you know, she's telling her off, but she's still kind of joking. So uh, we are in the process of analyzing it further, but what we want to conclude with is that actually these new global conditions with new technologies, cheap transportation and all of that, actually may allow for increased metalinguistic awareness. This is by far not what we observe for all our families. And this is always, this, this use of um, sociophonetic variation is actually linked to ideological alignments and networking practices, but it is also relational. So this is what happens within the family that actually matters. Um, and uh, what sort of interactional strategies uh, people employ in, a, uh, in the everyday life. And this is also shaped with complex models of indexicality within the Polish-speaking population, both in the UK and in Poland. So the variability is, a, is more of a product of sophisticated and detailed le learning across geographical and political borders uh, within the European space. And these parental strategies that we've observed and, um, have an impact on opportunities um, to acquire socially um, meaningful pronunciation. So if, um, if we do not really take variability into account, we can wrongly assess speakers in transnational space. So that's where I want to conclude. Thank you. So you mentioned these pieces of sophistication, mm -hmm. right? Um, is this in response to a perception that um, this cross-linguistic uh, multilingualism is a, is a signal of unsophistication? Because Oh, it's clearly sophisticated, mm -hmm. but why, why do you need to make that point? Oh, uh, yeah, I, I think the point that we want to make is um, that it's very easy to, um, to actually misrepresent some speakers, and uh, they are sophisticated in their everyday life, in that um, they use it in very complex ways, actually. And if you um, trace the history of speakers' uh, use of language, of the particular linguistic resource that you study, then you can um, kind of have a better understanding of why these, how these people acquired variation on the way. And today, I think what is quite relevant here is that it, it is the European space that is quite uh, uh, that allows that to happen. That actually the speakers who were born somewhere else um, acquired a very sophisticated knowledge of, um, of the sociophonetic variation as well. Thank you. Thank you.